Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, which is focused on attracting millennials while not alienating boomers in the process. The webinar is sponsored by Wine Glass Marketing. And before I kick it on over to Susan to get started, a quick note, this webinar is pre-recorded. However, both Susan and Nadia are present with us in the live chat. So if you have any questions along the way, just pop them into the live chat over here and they'll answer them as we go along. Now with that, I'll pass it on over to Susan. Thanks, Kim. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me this morning as we discuss this massive generational shift we're all coming to terms with. This has been pre-recorded by the wonderful people at Wine Industry Network because, well, honestly, I don't think they trust me to freestyle. And this was the way they could edit out all my mistakes and swear words. But I am now with you in the chat, so fear not. If you would like to share questions or be kind enough to share your comments, Nadia and I would love it, and we'll join the conversation with you as this is being aired. But first, introductions. I am Susan Dimite. I founded Wine Glass Marketing 11 years ago with the goal of being the most comprehensive, full-service marketing support agency for the alcohol industry. I have a team of 30 um, who are all employees, no subcontractors, and most live here in California. We have about 50 clients who are located all over the world, but most of them are here on the West Coast. And with me today is my friend, colleague, and client, Nadia Kincaid. Nadia brings with us decades of experience on brands such as Domaine Chandon, Cornerstone, and Nickel and Nickel. I've asked her to be our special guest star today because she's doing some amazingly creative things at Farniente, and she's agreed to share this with us. Thanks for having me, Susan. So let's go ahead and dive in. In the next 40 minutes or so, we are going to talk about millennials, but don't roll your eyes. We're going to get into some psychology onto why they're going to be different customers for you. Then we're going to move along on how spending behaviors have changed and will continue to evolve. Of particular interest will be wine clubs. So let's focus on them for a bit and talk about how those are going to change. And then finally, we're going to ask our special guest, Nadia, to review some of the exciting changes that they're doing over in Oakville. So why is this generational shift relevant to you? Well, now, full disclosure for me, I'm Gen X, so I've basically been wired from birth to believe that everybody's full of crap. Black is the only color that matters. Nine Inch Nails is perfectly acceptable office music. And I do frequently speak in Donkey Kong analogies. I'm a skeptic, but I'm telling you that I've done my research and I've read lots of psychology papers and talked to several human resources people who are in this field. And I have some understanding on why this change is so dramatic. So let's take a look at where we've been for the past 30 years. Here I have pulled up wine consumption by the, in the U.S. by year from the Wine Institute. And I've pointed out relevant dates. Before the past 30 years, Napa, Sonoma, other wine growing areas were primarily sleepy pickup truck towns like any other agricultural community. They didn't really have a direct to consumer or a hospitality business. But boomers who have been the core of our wine drinkers since they turned 21 in 1967 got a real taste of encouragement with the judgment of Paris in May of 76, and then again in the famous 60-minute program, The French Paradox, which aired in November of 91. Boomers who were probably tired of being told to work hard, be responsible, and wait until retirement to enjoy life, eagerly believed Maury Safer when he said that drinking good wine was good for your heart. Boomers have a reliable and an understandable foundation, and it connected with many of the winery stories. Boomers can relate to the American dream of the farmer that's worked hard and stumbled upon this perfect 100-point wine, made it big, and now lives happily ever after, leading the good life and training his children to take over. Indeed, wine country itself is modeled after a baby boomer's view of an ideal vacation. It's full of good friends, good food, free time activities like golf and spas, 
and luxuries for this weekend getaway before you have to go back to work. Baby boomers join clubs for a number of reasons as well. They find financial, they find value in financial independence, home ownership, and building secure foundations for their families. Boomers may be cautious about spending and prioritizing uh, savings over expenditures and immediate gratification. It's a responsible choice for them to not only be physically smart, but then they also like logical proof points and external signals that they're on the right path. Boomers value process. They tend to evaluate and then choose brands and stay loyal to them. And then when boomers uncover something new, they were taught that then you're the winner and, and there are winners and losers and you don't share. They like having things that nobody else has. They don't mind waiting in line or in a list for years to get an allocation. Why? Because that tells them that they've arrived. They're an insider now. And when they've arrived, they expect to pe see people like them. They tend to find comfort in homogeneous groups where they know that they're like others and they belong. It's really important for us to understand that absolutely everything about selling wine direct to consumers up until this date has been about boomer psychology. All of it is about what baby boomers want and how to sell to them. So let's look at why this shift is so significant. It's basically the size. We are currently in the most massive generational shift that the world has actually ever seen. So each generation is about 20 to 25 years, right? Boomers were a big generation of 75 million. I already noted that Gen Xers are the original social distancers and we don't like being marketed to. So we're seldom over, we're usually overlooked and seldom marketed to, which is okay because we're also a very small generation. But millennials are as big as baby boomers. They're 75 million again. They're all between 27 and 42 now, which is prime drinking ages. Now, what follows millennials is another massive generation of Gen Z. Now, this chart here was done with the last census data, and it doesn't include the totality of the generation. So Gen Z is now estimated to be larger than millennials or boomers, somewhere around 80 million. So your takeaway here is it's actually okay if millennials and Gen Zers don't drink the same volume as baby boomers because there's over two times as many of them. And now let's look why. Why are they different? Is it just because, you know, kids don't understand nowadays? Actually, that's not it. It has nothing to do with age and everything to do with technology and not just the Internet. Starting in the 2000s, several technological advancements caused a significant shift in lifestyle, education, healthcare, communication, and farming. A computer, a computer chip with 2,000 transistors cost $1,000 back in 1970. That Today, that same chip is about two cents. That means there is substantial processing power available to almost anyone at any income level. With all of those people on the internet creating data, here's a stat for you. 90% of all data in the history of the world has been created in the last two years. Computing power doubles every 18 months. This massive boost in technology has changed our everyday behavior. Due to the progression of technology and its increased rate of change, there is a large gap in lifestyle and, and processes and how people are living their lives constantly evolving. This gap between technology is most commonly seen between millennials and boomers. Let's look at a few of these gaps. So let's say we're in high school um, and we need to research a paper for Shakespeare. Now, I went to Centennial High School, class of 87, go Eagles. We didn't have a computer at home. Um, we didn't even know what the internet was yet. Um, so if I had a paper, I had to remember to ask my mom for bus money 
and tell her I was going to the library after school. Remember to take that different bus after school to go to the library. Go to the library and remember my library card. Use the Dewey Decimal System or maybe the Encyclopedia Britannica. Spread out my index cards on the table, take notes from all my different sources. I then went home. I had to handwrite my paper and then borrow my mom's typewriter to type it up. Now, now a child in high school can either ask Siri or have ChatGPT write it for them. And I'm not saying that, you know, in my day, we used to walk three miles to school every day in the snow. That's not my point. But we understood and appreciated and had the patience to go through processes and understood that a process had to be adhered to in order to get to the end result. That reverence for process isn't really present in generations that grew up with technology. With the internet, seeing what you're doing with the information right now is infinitely more important and interesting than the process that, that took you to get that information. So they're absolutely not going to sit on a long waiting list to get something. They are not looking for your process or story. They're looking for what you're doing today and how you fit into their values. Another example, if you can imagine, and I have a hard time, but imagine what it must have been like or must be like growing up feeling pressured to be on social media and knowing that in doing so, everyone at your school knows everything about you. That must seriously affect your values. One of the complaints we older folks have is that younger generations think they're special. Well, they are. I mean, everybody knows their name. They know what they did last weekend. They know what they wore. They know who they were with. They know what they ate. I mean, it's kind of like being a celebrity. All of this together has given them this expectation of people know me. People know my likes and dislikes. They expect people and brands to know them. Only 35% of Gen Zers have any expectation of privacy whatsoever. It's really become this traded aspect for all the data. We've traded our privacy for access to things faster. So one implication here is really know your CRM. Your note taking is critical here as are personalized messages and marketing. Secondly, another byproduct of being on social media is that they have strong opinions and they comment. They will not hesitate to tell anyone what they think about your wine, your staff, or your tasting room. And while my generation was told to be seen and not heard, this generation is all in. You know everything about them. So there is no mask when they're on public display. And finally, having a thick skin just doesn't begin to cover it. They have been conditioned since a very young age to not only expect external opinions and criticisms, but ignore them. For boomers, this work hard, play hard mentality, we got them to the, the, the tasting line to consider the wine, but then that validation of the 95 point score put them over the edge to purchase it. For these new consumers, they don't care what other people say. They will decide what they like. Now, they do care about their community and they will take peer reviews into consideration. They've, they've grown up with a larger peer group than any other generation in history. They are very team oriented. There's also a much broader definition of inclusion than past generations because they've been introduced to various types and cultures of people earlier on. While boomers were taught to fight for number one and covet that first spot, post-technology generations, they wanna discover something and then they wanna share it. When they got an award, they wanna tell everybody how to get that reward, how else they can get it. Their first instinct is to always share this information with others. The result of all this is that your future customers shop very differently. Boomers shopped in person or on PC and newer generations shop on apps or in social media. 
they pay differently too. 75% of the buy now, pay later category are millennials. They love different ways to purchase, like buy now, pick up in store, or try on now, buy later, which is becoming really popular. Not only do they look for groups with different viewpoints, but they demand diversity from the companies that they do business with. They want to know the company's story. They want to know your values, why you're in business, and it can't just be to make money. They want to see purpose in your brands. When boomers enjoyed the process of gathering information, culminating in this being loyal to a brand, Post-technology generations, they don't see any value in process or loyalty. They are in a perpetual mode of trial. They look for variety in all things. In fact, they will do the opposite of a stereotype just to poke fun of it. I love this picture here because it's Post Malone and it's his wine in Maison Number no. 9. Uh, of course, it's a rosé. Here is this face rapper with a face tattoo posing as, I guess, a stockbroker. I'm not quite sure. I believe he's drinking the rosé over ice. And below this page are cocktail recipes for how you can mix his wine with sodas and juices for different cocktails. Can you imagine going to your winemaker and telling him that you want to do a photo shoot by putting his wine over ice and then come up with cocktail recipes to mix juice and soda with it? Yeah, it's just not how our, our wine industry typically rolls. It's very, very different. All of this matters because of the mix of consumers you have right now. So this is the chart from the most recent Silicon Valley Bank. Basically, right now, 45% of your market is over the age of 40. 55% of your market is under the age of 40. If you consider 40 about the cutoff for the internet, you can see that you have two very different audiences. So now let's take a look at how these two audiences affect spending patterns. In the 50s, after World War II, the government wanted to boost the American economy. So they started a number of campaigns to encourage consumerism in America. This, uh, the person with the most toys wins mentality has really been prevalent for the past 60 years. The goal of being an American was to amass volume. Costco is good. All you can eat is good. Volume typically meant savings and a good buy. That is not how generations now think. They do not like waste. They are not swayed by quantity as a value. <clears throat> So your implication here is when you're looking at pricing and offers, realize that this new audience will be decreasingly motivated by case sales or volume discounts. Boomers like external validation. They've worked hard. And these external brands that they wear and badges that they've done well for themselves are endorsement of the fact that they've arrived. There's nothing wrong with this. Younger generations, however, as we talked about on social media, they have learned to listen to their internal voices. They think that image-driven marketing is actually funny. They make parodies of it. Just think of memes. This is a used car salesman named Jared Hooter from Chevy Land in Shreveport, Louisiana. He made national news and sold a lot of cars by doing hilarious photo shoots for the cars he had in stock. He took the typical luxury aesthetic and he made fun of it and was successful. Along with the push for consumerism in the U.S. to help economy, the government never really encouraged travel. They wanted you to stay in America, spend money here. The responsible thing to do as an American was to work hard, and when you retire, you can have life experiences. But the internet has opened up the world to a new generation, and they want to see it. There are many surveys out there, and they all show that millennials and Gen Zers will pay for and value experiences over products. The implication here is obvious for you is to spend more time focused on your experience as time progresses and to this new audience. So the result of all of this accumulation is that you have something to show for it, right? 
you have that big house, you have the big toys, you have lots of designer clothes and nice jewelry. All these possessions have value. There are security for future generations and you worked hard and you feel like it was worth it. For people that grew up with technology, they're adulting very differently. They appreciate companies that add value that contribute to their life. And ease of use is the top thing on the list. We've moved into an age where services are the ultimate sign of luxury. If you make somebody's life easier, if you can deliver that within 30 minutes, if you can have a car within 20 minutes and get some there, that's value and that's luxury. The ease of use also bleeds into the buying experience. In pre-technology generations, we valued the chase, right? This was a generation of consumer reports. We expect to do our homework. We have to know the secret handshake and flash the ID card in order to get the special treatment. The more complicated it is, the more exclusive it has to be, right? But for technology generations, the easier it is, the faster it is, the better it is. <laughs> My, I particularly love where credit card processing has gone. So like I get how typing in some credit card numbers could be a pain. So everybody welcome the card swiper. But now swiping a card is too labor intensive. So we got to insert it with a chip. And now I guess insertion is too much of a bother. So now we kind of tap it or wave it over. I'm waiting for the day when we just sort of think our credit card number and something happens. But easy and fast is where everything is going, and that is the new luxury. And we can't get out of this discussion without talking about the environment. I read an article recently about what all these sort of cheap Target and Walmart clothes are doing to the environment. We don't think twice of buying an ugly sweater for a single Christmas party and then giving it to Goodwill. But the creation, shipping, storage, and eventual decay of that sweater all take a big toll on our carbon footprint. Recent generations are all about the impact their decisions have on the earth, thank God. And so they lean heavily into any brand that has a product with that message. So we've looked at how this affects spending, but how is this affecting clubs? Post-technology generations have a different definition of luxury, and that's the subscription box. They look for things that reduce time and hassle and therefore are convenient. So we spoke about personalization and how that is an expectation. But also with that comes the assumption that they can control choice. On the internet, they're faced with infinite choices. So subscription boxes are aggregators of these options for trial. It's also important for them to manage how much they use and reduce waste. As climate change and the environment becomes a critical issue, this is increasingly important to the most subscription model pitches. Flexible options, such as skipping a month, choosing a frequency or try before you buy are becoming attractive. Plus these loose guidelines indicate that the brand stands behind their products and they want you to be a satisfied customer. Some offer monthly mystery boxes or surprises, giving consumers a new product to try. It brings an added level of excitement to the upcoming boxing experience, and it gets consumers ex excited to expand their product selections. And finally, all of these subscription boxes are virtual. So there's no physical overhead. They can put all of their money into phone and online customer service. And that level of service is becoming the new bar as the standard of support. So some of you might be thinking, wine club, subscription box, what's the difference? It's just the same word. It's actually very different. In the wine club model, wineries pick the wine. In a subscription model, the customer chooses the products. In a club model, the winery says how often and when things will be shipped. Most subscription boxes allow consumers to choose their schedule. Wine clubs are loyalty clubs, so they focus on what the member likes. Subscription boxes are introductory tools to focus on variety and trial. 
And most wine clubs will include some sort of technical details about a product, whereas subscriptions might highlight a brand by telling us a story or introducing it to their founders. Boomers primarily joined clubs because they were a way for them to get their favorite wines at a discount. But millennials joined subscriptions because they're a more convenient way than going to a store. And finally, the wine club model is rooted in a sense of place. There's typically a physical location for events and community. Subscriptions are entirely virtual. It's simply a channel for trial and not about loyalty to the subscription brand itself. A sub typical subscription box owner is right in our sweet spot of about 25 to 45 years old. They have a decent income, but they're not rich yet. Women engage in subscriptions slightly more than men, but when males are, are into those subscriptions, they have more than women. Most have about two to three subscriptions and men tend to value subscriptions for the automation and the ease where women um, like subscription boxes for the variety. Millennials are particularly interested in subscription programs and 48% of them have four or more subscriptions. Why do they have so many? Well, the reasons I kind of talked about, they like them because one, they're easy, Two, they save money. And three, they can try lots of different things at the same time. So let's sum up this section. For your winery, if you want to start considering a subscription model, it should probably be monthly. You'll want to put some thought into your packaging. Remember the benefits and make it super easy. They will all expect the ability to skip a shipment and personalize. Remember that service is key. Spend some time training your customer service on a variety of channels. One of the quickest growing customer service channels is text. Here's a text I get every month about my dog's bully box, kind of previewing the toys that, that they're shipping. And then each little box is expected to have a little surprise. It doesn't have to be much, but something about your brand that gets them to know you. So let's take a look at the types of subscription boxes that are out there. It's important to know what role we play in the consumer's terms. So an obvious purpose is a replacement of an essential item on a regular basis. This is the Amazon monthly you know, reorder kind of thing. The selling point of a replenishment subscription is convenience. Consumers don't need to remember to replace these items. The model enables entrepreneurs to put an exciting twist on a boring standard product and give them um, new options that's usually considered a chore to go to the store and repurchase. Possibly the world's most famous replenishment service is the Dollar Shave Club. They hit on a winning formula by offering consumers the ability to get free razor, to get fresh razor blades delivered to their doorstep monthly for a small fee. And before you say it, no, wine is not a replenishment service. Curation service is actually where wine clubs lie. This usually takes the form of a carefully packaged experience that's designed to surprise and delight a consumer with a selection of products selected according to their likes and dislikes. The appeal of a curated subscription box is the robust opportunity for product discovery and the personalized nature of the experience. Because products are picked just for them, this helps them to foster strong customer loyalty towards the new brands. Curated subscriptions are offered across a variety of product categories with beauty, confectionery, and apparel being some of the most popular. The example here, Birchbox, is a beauty subscription box delivering five samples of trending beauty products per month, according to the preference in a beauty quiz. Subscribers can review each product they, they receive, which is then in turn to market that product to other members. And there's also the ability to buy full-size versions of these products directly from Birchbox. And some of these cannot be bought elsewhere, so they're their own retail channel. 
Access subscriptions are the third type. These enable consumers to view and use a specific service in exchange for a monthly fee. The subscription model is commonly used by media broadcast producers or somebody who would have multiple pricing models with escalating levels of, ac of access. That's think like Netflix or Disney Plus. This type generally requires the lowest level of investment from a consumer once the subscription has begun, but it does require a lot of initial investment from the company to get the services ready for that subscription. When do people buy subscriptions or why? Mostly it's for the discovery, but that's followed closely by the sharing element and the desire to belong to a group of people experiencing the process together. Rounding out the top three is the discount. Why do they leave? Well, it's pretty closely tied between the value and the experience. I always perk up when I hear the word value on a survey. Remember that value is subjective. At one point, your club was worth the value. They got what they paid for it and it was an equitable deal. But if you start seeing value show up on your exit surveys, you better dig in and find out what happens on your side to make the experience now not worth the money any longer. So what can you do today? My main advice is to start thinking in the form of two distinct different strategies. If 45% of your market is now over the age of 40 and 55% of your market is under the age of 40 and both of these groups buy very differently, then it would be wise to have two sets of programs, wouldn't it? I am not suggesting that you change what has always worked for boomers because that will continue to work for boomers. But you had better get started on working on some initiatives in parallel for the millennials and Gen Zers. We know this customer group isn't so much interested in your product specifications, so you need to determine your unique value to them that is not your wine. Assume they will never come to the winery. What else can you in involve them in? What else can you offer them? This example here is a very fun client that we have. Uh, it's, it's, in a, it's a winery in Kansas called Oz. And they happen to own the rights for the Wizard of Oz books. Uh, they make very fun wines called Drunken Munchkin and Glenda's Bubbly. Um, and they know that their consumers are into the Oz books and not necessarily into wine. So their wine club never took off because it was a typical loyalty club. Um, but we revamped it into a quarterly subscription box. We started giving all the variety of their different labels and we started giving little presents like stickers. And right here, we're showing a set of pins that we made for them from items of the book. And you have to stay around for these you know, next four shipments in order to get the whole set. Since we have relaunched this, it, was, it had us a 209% increase in subscribers in the last quarter. Since millennials have more subscriptions to balance, they will most likely look for opportunities to change. And that might be a risk of churn, but it also presents a very good opportunity for you. The millennials desire to try new things, create an opportunity to continue the conversation with them, provide a variety of products and experiences for them. And it's critical to keep them in your subscription sort of ecosystem. One way to do that is provide a continuing stream of new options. Um, they are very interested in trying something new. In fact, trying something new was the primary reason that they joined and canceled your subscription. So don't think of them again like these loyalty subscriptions of wine clubs of the past. These are these are no harm, no foul. I want to try some things for a while. Both Gen Z and millennials are used to a barrage of new ideas. I mean, just look at TikTok. Uh, your new product development strategy and your new marketing strategy needs to show some continuous streams of evolution for them. Think about your process. Millennials like to shop online and they value convenience 
more than saving money. So reduce some of the things that they have to call in for or go on site for. For your new programs, avoid convoluted login processes and needs to con contact you for personalized service. Boomers responded well to that, but millennials will not. Remember, luxury to them is easy, fast, and virtual, just practically the exact opposite of boomers. Still do your tech sheets and submit your wines for scores, for sure, but start thinking about other consumption triggers. Don't sell your product so much, but flesh out your brand story and what it means to interact with your brand. And maybe that's a tattooed man making cocktails with his rosé. And finally, rethink your brand right to the drop off at the door. Amazon has trained us that delivery is part of the expectation. The problem is, is that Amazon is vertically integrated and they own their delivery fleet. We don't have that luxury. We can't control FedEx, but we can control our packaging. Other industries have got here first and they've set the bar really high, but include gifts, brand your packaging and do something better than cardboard and styrofoam. Now, I would like to hand it over to our special guest this webinar, Nadia Kincaid. Nadia, I can't think of a more OG classic tasting room than Farniente. I would actually bet that a big traditional winery like yours would be one of the biggest resistors to change, you, but you're leading the pack. Tell me some of the things you're doing over there. So thank you, Susan. Uh, when I started at Farniente Wine Estates five years ago, I came into a company that had beautiful brands, wonderful wines, and a wonderful sized club, but a club that had a nutrition problem. So what I wanted to do was figure out what we were doing well and what were some areas of opportunity. The data was able to tell me, you know, when they were leaving and the cancellation reasons told me why but I wanted to understand for the people who hadn't left yet what they thought we did well and where I could improve things for them. So I started with a survey and surveys I think are one of the more underutilized tools that we have at our fingertips to better understand our customers and the service we're providing to them. So I asked them everything from you know why they joined and where they joined, the benefits that made them want to join. And then I asked them how we were delivering on those benefits. I asked them about our events, you know, what we currently do, as well as, you know, their interest in additional events, if we were to add them, their consumption behavior, their preferred communication cadence and um, channel preference. And I asked them about what other clubs they're in. You mentioned that people tend to be in multiple subscriptions. I asked them, you know, how many are you in and which ones? And we've joined them and we, so we can see, you know, when we, when our customers are evaluating us, we want to be able to understand how, like what lens they're using for that. So that gave me a really good um, overview of our club. And from that, I developed a 10-year program. And, you know, I'm going to speak to the traditional clubs first. You know, they operate very similarly, I'm sure, to any club in the industry and with similar benefits, as well as the expected pattern of uh, demographics and geographic spread. Now, with the 10-year program, what I did is I went about alleviating some of their pain points at the key points of drop-off so that the longer they're in the club, the more benefits they get, and we're rewarding them for that loyalty. Now, something as a millennial I've always wanted to do was a subscription, and we didn't really have the technology to do so. When the pandemic hit, we no longer had that luxury of waiting for the technology to catch up. So I launched the hosted at home subscription program. And 
It's two to three bottles a month for $200. It includes shipping. Unlike the traditional clubs, Hosted at Home builds the benefit into the pricing, the ease, and the delivering you know, directly to them. So, and they have a virtual experience. Now we do let our traditional club members join because these are these virtual experiences are a great way for people to interact directly with our winemakers. Um, what this has enabled us to do is, you know, really meet that um, trial mentality for customers, as well as spread geographically outside of the typical club model and be more Midwest and East Coast focused. Now, we were concerned because the AOV is lower, but with the frequency, we're noticing that we have a similar average lifetime value as our traditional clubs. We do see people that come in, join, use it as a sampling you know, option, and some leave. Some decide to join one of our more traditional clubs because they want to experience the events that we have here in Napa and around the country. We also see that it's become a really big gifting opportunity, both for our corporate clients and our traditional club members, as well as other people in the host at home subscription, because they can experience this with their friends that may not live near them, which was certainly imp important during the early stages of the pandemic, but it continues to be important today as travel is expensive and, um, you know, people still strive for that connection. So, so now you have two ways for consumers to interact with you, one at the introductory stage, you know, for trial, and then one at the loyalty stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm interested that the tiered program you have to keep the loyalty high and them engaged in your traditional club is a great idea. What about concerns of, you know, an off ramp for those, for those boomers that maybe want to cut down on their spending or on their clubs? How are you handling that? Yeah, that's a great question. So one of the things I noticed in that first survey that has been consistent every year uh, in the survey is that people, the retiring and seller too full are some of our bigger cancellation reasons. So I wanted to address that. And I wanted to really reward our customers who have been really longtime members and reward that loyalty. So I did create a uh, off-ramp club, a retention club that people can only join when they've been in our club for several years or have hit a certain lifetime spend. And that club is reduced frequency and reduced number of bottles. They can add as much as they, they like, but it really just gives them that base level where they can retain their benefits. And the other thing that we've done is we have let them as they hit retirement age, if they want to pass on the club to a relative, they can do so. So we'll oh, transfer yeah. the club and all of its tenured benefits to their children. Wow. That's, that's yeah. really smart. Thank you. It's, you know, it's, we, our mentality is to do what's right for the customer and that it'll pay off for us. And so far that it's been a very successful <laughs> way mm -hmm. of looking at it for us. Well, in, 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 let's share your website here. I think also too, it's interesting how you explain all of these various options on, you know, to your customers. Yeah. So we have, you know, what you're seeing now is the, how we lay out all of the traditional clubs so people can see the frequency and the pricing and the wines that are included. And, and there are some variation of benefits. We highlight the Epicuria Club, which is our club that is at capacity. It's limited to 100 people. And then we also here showcase the subscription option with Hosted at Home. So you have it all clearly laid out on the website and in a brochure so people can self-select what phase they are with you and all these different types of options to connect with you. Exactly. And it's it's really a choose your own adventure. And what we, with the exception of a few clubs, we also allow a lot of customization, pretty much sky's the limit for our customers. We 
I have no interest in forcing someone to buy a bottle of wine that they don't want to enjoy. They're not going to want to stay in our club if we're doing that. So as long as it's reasonable and possible, we will make every accommodation for our members and our staff are very empowered to make any decision necessary to make them happy and, um, you know, just meet them where they are in their preference, you know, in taste and their preference in price points. Excellent. Now, one of the other ways that we have, you know, we look to create that white glove experience in every way is offering various ways of um, communicating with us. So obviously she is sending the world's longest text message, <laughs> um, but we do have, you know, the traditional phone and email last fall, we layered in texting and we started it really as a way to help remind our customers that they needed to update, you know, their, uh, the last day to customize with coming up and allowing them to upgrade their shipments, make any changes to their uh, shipping information. And we found that we've been able to reach more people that way that maybe we're missing the emails or phones. Mm -hmm. So we've seen a reduction in return shipments. We've seen an increase in the number of bottles in the shipments. And we found that removing these barriers and steps to purchase if you has been really um, well-received. And the technology enables us to do hyper-targeted tar tar communications. So we use analytics for segmentation. If I want to know, you know, who's purchased this particular wine, but not this particular vintage. And I want to, you know, they haven't purchased in the last 30 days. I can find that. I can send them, you know, we can send a quick text. We can just talk to people. Hey, we know that you really love this particular wine. There's 30 bottles left let us know if you'd like some. And we find that people are very receptive to it. And regardless of age and generation, they just appreciate being spoken to as if we know them because we do have the data. So there shouldn't, there really is no excuse not to talk to them as if we know them. We can know them if we want to. We just have to really dig into the data. And as I mentioned this across the demographic, the reaction has been incredibly positive. People are thankful for how easy it is to text back their order or update their card. Um, they're thankful for the reminders about the customization and that we can do it for them. They find it easier than sending us an email or calling us back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've looked into research on push notifications too for those companies that have apps and those are the same way. They're very um, welcomed. But I think what I love here is how you're giving a choice again to people. You're not telling them, okay, we're all migrating to this new thing or forcing any change. You're just giving options available um, and letting people self-select. I think that's great. Thank you. Now, when we talk about, you know, the, this breadth, of generations, we do see different interests, obviously, in the kind of events. So we have our luxury dinners, the large release events that we were known for and still continue to be known for. But we've layered in from the survey, we've taken some of the things that people were asking us for. They wanted something more casual. So we created these Friday night events that run all summer long at both properties. We have the harvest food and wine experiences, the harvest and holiday open houses. And one big thing is we added the club lounge at both properties. Now, one thing that was really apparent is that we, people previously would go on the same tour or the same tasting every time they visited. And our customers, I'll never forget, someone even said, I could give this tour at this point. I just <laughs> want to come and drink the wine. And like, okay, great, let's do it. So we created these special places where they can come and they can choose, choose their own adventure from a selection of wines so that they're tasting what they want. They're enjoying the property and the wines and their benefit without having to, you know, hear the same thing that they've may, maybe heard. And those, of course, are still available if they do want to bring someone new in and experience that. Now around the country, you know, 
most of our members don't live in California. So we take our show on the road and we do bring Farniente into our key markets with luxury garden dinners. And we create small winemaker dinners ahead of these or any other events that we do in the market. We do fun events like more casual, like our baseball event in Chicago. We run a rooftop and, and watch a game. And the virtual experiences, of course, that, you know, whether we're broadcasting from the winery or just talking to one of our winemakers or a key host, it just gives people, again, it's about variety. They can interact with us in whatever way they want to. And it is fascinating that it's not, while the baseball event does skew younger for the most part, these events run the gamut for um, the generations. I went the lobster and the baseball game like right. together. Yeah. I went a lobster dinner at a baseball game. <laughs> now, one thing that's really exciting for us is Bella Union. We finally found a home for Bella Union a couple of years ago. It's currently under construction and we are targeting a summer 2024 opening. Now, this is our opportunity to give people a lot more variety than we're able to do a nickel and nickel and farniente. So it's various wines, different blends, different price points, you know, really going to be a great vehicle for that trial. Of course, it's one of our estates. So that same gracious, warm hospitality is still going to be there, but there's going to be this range of experiences. So starting from the outside where it's gonna be more casual and you can order by the bottle or by the glass. And then making your way inside, you can get these more educational and interactive experiences. And the thought here again is really just offering customers what they want when they want it. Outdoor, indoor, bring your kids, bring your dog, you know, things that we we can't do at the other estates and um, just very exciting. Um, I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait to see yeah. that. What, what, so obviously you have the opportunity and the, the means to spin up another brand. What about those on, on this call that maybe don't have the resources for that? Any ideas? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I was at Cornerstone, we had no budget. <laughs> so what we we had a variety of experiences. You can use your same wine and approach it differently. You know, there's wineries that pair wine with donuts, so they pair it with potato chips or, you know, there's there's so many creative things that people are doing and it doesn't have to be expensive. I mean, you can do a you know, quick tasting. So many ex experiences in Napa have gotten more expensive and longer. And while there's always going to be a place for that, there is so much opportunity in things that are, that mm -hmm. are different. And you have so much control with that um, without even opening a new property. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of interesting. If you, if you look at the, the curve, you know, five, six years ago, definitely pre-pandemic, we were all talking about seated tastings and, you know, not being at the bar and, you know, making it more involved. And now it's like, we're, you know, the rubber band's kind of snapping back from that. Yeah. I, I also, I also I think, think, go ahead. Oh, well, I think that's what for me is so exciting about Bella Union is there's the outside is really that, you know, come up to the bar, make friends, you know, hear what each other are liking in that um, convivial nature. And then you can go inside and have this more in-depth blending experience. And it's, you know, choose your own adventure. Mm -hmm. And I think too, if maybe wineries could have a, a second label or, you know, some, some only wines to this subscription box only wines or something like that, you know, it doesn't have to be like a whole tasting experience and everything, but to do something to just bifurcate your marketing so that you have, you know, two different offerings um, is wise. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we have for you guys today. Um, Nadia, thank you so much for being open and sharing and, you know, giving your time and um, telling us what's going on over there. I think 
you know, you're, you're doing what a lot of people should be doing, in, in my opinion, which is, you know, really just taking a fresh look at how we've been doing things and realizing everything up to this point has been based on a certain psychology and looking at the psychology of our new customers that are here now and how we can talk to them uh, it, it, with the same care and thoughtfulness that we have for boomers in the past 40 years. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>